Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Friday Afternoon, the Happy Hour webcast from WhiskeyCast.com. I'm Mark Gillespie in the WhiskeyCast studio in Haddonfield, New Jersey. Hope you have had a good week so far, that you're staying safe and healthy, and if you're eligible for your vaccine, that you've gotten it. And if you're like me, still waiting to become eligible, that you're still wearing your mask and doing all the right things so that we can get this bleeping pandemic over with so that we can all go visit distilleries again. We are trying something different today. We are on Twitch for the first time. Um, For those of you who are not familiar with Twitch, no, it's not uh, the sign of an itch or something you would do. It's another uh, online video service targeting the uh, gaming world. And uh, they also do stuff that's in real life as well. So we are going to give this a try. We are under the impression that... uh, In a couple of weeks, when Periscope goes away, that uh, Twitter will just take these video streams live on Twitter, and uh, we won't have to do anything, but we'll keep you posted when we get some word on that, on what the plans are. If you have a a chat function available, feel free to go ahead and uh, ask your questions, make your comments in the chat function. We will uh, pass along questions, pass along comments, and uh, share everything with the group, and... uh, Let's see. A. Champell says, hello, all had both vaccines. Uh, We have uh, Nurse Dave's Shaving World. Well, 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 here we are again. Dave Kuhn, happy Friday, folks. Uh, Let's see. Chris Ratcliffe, are we the new make? The chat not quite old enough to be called Whiskey Chat? Uh, Yeah, something like that. Uh, Dave Kuhn got his first Pfizer shot on Wednesday. Uh, Nurse Dave, I think Twitch is after my time. Uh, Michael Cerrito, greetings from Savannah, Georgia. Hi, Michael. And uh, Pete Head, our old pal. Evening, everyone. Willem Killian, uh, good evening and uh, good evening to you as well. Um, Chris Ratcliffe, Dave Kuhn, someone I know calls it their 5G upgrade. Okay, something like that. Uh, As Dave points out, the white dogs we are. Ah, this is our crowd, folks. Let's bring in our uh, pal uh, Gordon Bruce now. And uh, Gordon is joining us tonight from the little town of Knock in the highlands of Scotland, just outside of Huntley at Knock Dew Distillery. How are you tonight, Gordon? Very well, thanks, Mark. Yourself? Doing great. And uh, what is in your glass? A big glass of new make spirit to start with. (laughs) <laughs> That's a big glass of new make. And uh, a cheeky little exclusive that we did for Australia last year, which is a 2007 vintage bottling, only oh, bourbon nice. matured, 46% natural color, non gel filler. Very nice. Well, we have a few viewers in Australia, so uh, we will uh, see what uh, see if any of them are watching tonight. For the record, I was switching between uh, two of them. I started out with... Uh, the uh, Stories and Sips Irish Whiskey, the story from uh, Louise McGuain and our pals at Chapel Gate in Ireland, J.J. Corey. This was done for the uh, Stories and Sips Irish Whiskey group that uh, Barry Chandler leads. And I have uh, switched over, since I've got a little bit of this left, to a bottle that if you look very closely, you might see a little floater in there, the remnants of a cork. This is the uh, 1990 Sheep Dip. And I think it was bottled, oh, about 15 or so years ago. I'm not sure. Really, it has a vintage statement, not really an age statement. But it was one that uh, Richard Patterson blended. So, And Admiral Imports, I don't even know if they're still in business right now in New Jersey. So uh, we will uh, see what this is like. This is one I've enjoyed, but uh, getting down to the end of the bottle there. So we will enjoy that tonight. So what have you been up to besides getting ready to produce your own podcast? Now, Gordon, and we'll talk about that here as well. Life's pretty simple and not do. Just make whiskey, walk dogs, puddle about in the garden, spit, Mark, spit. Uh, make whiskey, walk dogs, basically, that's, that's life. Got a uh, piece of cork. Little floaters of cork in there. It's fiber. Think of it that way. It's nutritional. It's not true. Uh, Kent Moore from South Arm Distillery is joining us from Tasmania. Hopefully, uh, Kent, I don't know if you got to try that uh, Anak exclusive 2007 for Australia, but uh, if you did, let us know what you think about it. Um, Willem he says, usually I would have a big glass of water with my dram, and this gentleman has a big glass of new make. 
<laughs> I make the <sighs> stuff. So tell us about Knocktails, the podcast that you are producing now. Yeah, this is a, a new initiative from our digital marketing team. Uh, obviously, travels last year and visitors to the distillery was put on hold for a year. So it, it's an opportunity for us to, to, to reach a, a wider audience. Uh, and importantly, it's, it's not just purely about whiskey. Uh, I love seeing things made well, done well, and made with a bit of passion. So we'll be speaking to lots and lots of different people well, hopefully we'll be speaking to lots and lots of different people throughout the series. Uh, you mentioned telescope, no, not telescope, periscope and Twitch, and these things are totally over my head. I'm a total novice to this thing. So it's it's a wee bit homespun, a wee bit homemade. Uh, hopefully good fun. And your first guest on the very first episode was our, our good friend Jared Hempstead from Balconis. Uh, tell us about that conversation. Well, it was a brand new one for me, obviously. I'd never sat in front of a microphone before. And honestly, we, we couldn't have got a, found a better guest to get us going. Uh, John is just such a, a, a nice, easy guy to speak to. Uh, very, very generous with his time, his responses. Um, it, it certainly put me at ease. Uh, I haven't listened to it yet, and I, I probably won't listen to it, to be honest. But the, the feedback's been pretty positive. So well, I think we're off to a decent start. And you're not going to listen because you hate the sound of your own voice, right? Exactly. Yep. Yep. Now, in interviews we've done in the past, the PR folks have always been off on the side and just going, oh, dear God, oh, dear God, please don't let him say anything that we have to delay. How do you how'd you guys do a podcast with a seven second delay on it? Uh, thankfully, it's not broadcast live. We had edit facilities. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know. I, don't I remember score once in that one, actually, yeah. Well, I remember when we were talking uh, the first time I was there and we toured back in 2011, it was right after the warehouse fell down and uh, you were, used a really nasty reference to the folks on the council that were giving you grief about rebuilding the warehouse. No, the PR no, person's you, going, must, you must be mistaken. No, no, no. Yeah, no, the PR person I remember is going, could you please edit that out? <laughs> We'd like to actually get planning permission. <laughs> No, I thought but, you, uh, you've mistaken me for somebody else, Mark. No, I, I wouldn't do something like that. It was Stuart like Harvey. Yeah, probably, yeah. Like, or Bobby at Spayburn. Yeah, he's, he's pretty potty mouth. yeah. <laughs> Other folks within the company. Now, it was actually McDonald up at Bell Lair. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's an absolute rogue. Watch yourself. You know. Yeah, he's the one who snuck the uh, fish key in on me during a blind tasting one time as a prank up there. Did you enjoy it? Oh, hell no. It was the worst whiskey I'd tasted up to that point. But uh, tell us about the distillery itself, because a lot of folks, people go looking for a knock distillery, and you have one of the few distilleries in Scotland that bottles its single malt under a different name than the distillery, because there's yeah, well, another distillery with a really similar name that's owned by a really big company with lots of lawyers. Yeah, I mean, we actually reached a gentleman there was agreement a few years back. So we are not do distillery, and the, the the other distillery is Nakando Distillery. It's a, it's a bit unfortunate. Knock do is actually older than Nakando, but Nakando had single malt whiskey on the shelf before Knock do went to have single malt whiskey on the shelf. So we bought the distillery in 1988. It'd been silent and been mothballed for five years. Fired it up again in 1989. We bought it with stocks, so we, we started bottling and selling not do single malt whiskey. And things were great for three, four years, no problem at all. And then a bit of confusion arose. So we did the, the honorable thing and we changed the name of the product. We not do is garlic for Black Hill, the, the hill where we draw the water from. Uh, we now bottle the, the liquid with the single malt as our knock, which is garlic for the hill. So we've kept the connection with the hill, which is very, very important to us. But as you say, it, it does confuse a lot of people. But once you get used to it, it's real simple. I mean, it's a hard distillery to find, but it's well worth it. And uh, the last time I was there, you were still not open to visitors at all. And well, pre-pandemic, you had opened up to visitors slightly. Uh, you really have to look hard to find a knock distillery because it's in the middle of a bunch of cow pastures out northwest of Huntley, right? I've got a couple of wee objections here to your, your description of the beautiful area where I live. 
Oh, I love the area. I'm just saying that you got to go some to find it. It doesn't show up on your typical GPS. No, seeking you shall find. It, it, it's worthwhile, worthwhile seeking out, I think, yeah. So tell me about the relationship you have with uh, your master blender, Stuart Harvey. Stuart, well, we've got Stuart uh, in the blending team these days. We've got Mark Williamson, very, very good. He's, he's more the the day-to-day, -day, the dirty stuff. And his new assistant, uh, the, the very, very lovely Claire Bresman. And Claire's got a fantastic nose, great personality, really, really good team. Uh, other old guy, old guy, <laughs> same age as me, Alan Roberts in the lab down there. We, we get pretty good feedback from Alan too on spirit quality. So a nice, nice bunch of people to work alongside. Uh, and folks, if, if go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, yeah, geographically are a wee bit distant. So we live in a beautiful part of Scotland. Head office blending maturation takes place down in Airdrie, which is probably a slightly less beautiful part of Scotland, but never probably beautiful to them, which is probably about three and a half, a like, good three and a half hours away. So It's we're, down we're closer to the busy part of Scotland, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What about, what attracted you to Noctua in the first place? Because I know you worked at a couple of the other Inverhouse distilleries in your career, right? Uh, my hometown distillery is Pulteney in Wick. So we, we started there as a marshman in 1988 under the, the late John Black, a great guy to work for. I left Pulteney in 1994 as brewer, moved down to Ball Blair as, as brewer there, and then moved down to Knock Do in 2006 as the distillery manager. So we haven't moved too far. So you're celebrating 15 years this year then, right? A 16 years here this year. Okay. Well, it's 2021. You said, uh, okay, so yeah, 95. So yeah, 16 years then. What about, so tell us about that new make you were tasting. Give us the tasting notes on the new make, because a lot of folks never really get to taste new make unless you actually visit a distillery. What's the new a make great, taste like before it hits a barrel? Uh, that's a great thing. I mean, that's one of the great things about coming to visit a distillery. You're going to get, the, hopefully you'll get the chance to have a wee sniff. And obviously you can't sip it because that's illegal. You'd have to pay excise duty. Uh, our new make, we're looking for a very, very fruity, a very, very estery spirit, and hopefully with a little bit of malt, a little bit of cereal there as well. And we always keep our new make strength below 70% alcohol by volume. We find if we get above 70%, it becomes a little bit too clean. We lose the, the key notes that are coming through from the raw materials. Uh, the first thing you do when you come into work in the morning, you go up, you take a wander about the tun room, you lift the lids and you have a wee sniff. And you can follow how the fermentations are progressing by the nose. And these, these smells, flavors that are produced during the fermentations, they'll pass the whole way through the distillation process and they'll end up in your glass of new make, your bottle of new make. So I always think it's a great pity when people think about distilleries, they, they, they really focus on these big, sexy copper kettles, these copper pots, which are okay, there's a bit of conversion. It's really just an extraction process. The magic takes place in the mashing, the fermentation stages. That's where most of the smells, flavors, or tastes are produced in, in new make whiskey. And I wish people would look a wee bit more at that magical part of the process. And that's the process we've got most variables to play with as well. Explain, because uh, a lot of folks think, well, it all comes out of the wood. But unless you put good spirit into wood to begin with, you're not going to get good whiskey out of it. No, no, you could put a, a real crappy new make into a beautiful quality cask and you're still going to have a crappy whiskey at the end of the day. Um, I, I, I know different blenders, different distillers will say the the influence of the wood is X, Y or Z. Here, I would like to think we're somewhere about 50-50. absolutely adore the new make from here. In fact, we've, we've just finished our annual peated campaign. We make, we make a peated whiskey here for four or five weeks a year as well. The peat you make is absolutely stunning. First time I made that stuff here, I had to take a wee sample bottle home for my wife and kids to smell. It's just absolutely gorgeous. We've got these beautiful estuary floral notes and the, the peat doesn't mask it. The, the peat, peat just combines with it, joins with it beautifully. Where did your uh, peat come from? It's in Fergus peat, so it's Aberdeenshire peat. So it's, it's very, very similar in composition to the peat we'd have used here. 
100, 125 years ago. So chemically, it's, it's, it's probably almost identical. And that's one of the things I know you've tried to do is tried to keep as much of the old history of the distillery alive as you can. I know last time I was there, the you had turned the old kiln into a sort of a museum of sorts and had one of the old grain threshers out back that you were trying to restore. And you really sort of take this historical interest in preserving the, uh, the heritage of the distillery, right? It's such an important part of not just the distillery, but the industry as a whole. I mean, God forbid we forget where we come came from. Uh, in 2013, we actually changed the layout in the kiln a wee bit. So I think you were here before we did that. Before uh, and after. Yeah, it was, I, so you saw when we chopped the back out of the hopper and we built the extra two fermentation vessels. Uh, put those in in 2013. Uh, I'll, I'll say... I, I, I can't remember what I had for dinner yesterday. I can't remember the last time you were here, Mark. Uh, but we've got a very, very unusual setup here now. So we've got six wash bags in the tun room. And the only available space we had to build some more fermentation vessels in the back of the kiln. So we cut the back out of the old hopper. We left the rest of it as is. And we, we've still got our, our museum there. But we, we also have an extra two fermentation, or almost wash bags, not quite wash bags, the, the fermentation vessels. So it's pretty cool for the visitor's perspective because normally when you have a distillery tour, you go into the upper tun room and you'll see the top three, four foot of a washback. Here you can see the, the whole thing from top to bottom. You can really appreciate the scale. You can see how the things are built, uh, built traditionally. So they taper from top, or very, very slightly from top to bottom. Uh, they're, they're pretty cool things to see. I can um, tell you the last time I was there. Go ahead, finish up. I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. carry, carry on. <laughs> I can tell you the last time I was there because I can show it to you. You weren't there, as a matter of fact, which is why you don't remember it. Uh -huh. Because um, I was there in the fall of 2014 and uh, filled a cask with one of your guys. Uh, that that and, cask leaks like buggery. And uh, part of a press trip, they let us fill the cask, and I still have the boiler suit upstairs. Uh, took it out once uh, after I got home. And then I need to check with you about this because... That was the cask I filled, number 211 from 2014. It's on the ground floor of that uh, warehouse next to the distillery. I wanted to check and see how that cask is uh, maturing. Uh, you know offhand? No, I, I'll have a look. Have you actually signed the end of that cask? Was that yeah. your signature? That you we signed it. You do realize... Because we're, I was there on a Scotland. press trip and we signed the casks. You do realize under old Scottish law, that's actually a contract to buy. You've actually bought that cask, Mark. I can't wait because well, it's only seven years old. So uh, let me know when it hits at like 18 or so. And by then I may have saved up enough money to pay for it. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll get the invoice started. Get the invoice started because I, I want to see how that cask is doing because uh, I know Dave Worthington from that boutique whiskey company now and Annabelle Meikle, uh few of uh, other writers were on that trip too. And they're going to be surprised to see that they got uh, conned into buying these things as well. It wasn't conned, it was an opportunity. What was that cast number <laughs> in Mark? Sorry. Uh, 2014, 211. Okay. I'll, have 211. A I'll have a look for that next week and I'll let you know how it's doing. Let me know how it's doing. I can't wait. And the one thing I the one thing that makes Knock Do unique to almost every other distillery in well, anywhere in the world, with the possible exception of Pierce Lyons Distillery in Dublin which was built inside of an old cathedral is the stainless or the stained glass window in the Rick house that you had built after that one collapsed because of the snow. I got to hear the story behind this because you weren't there when I took that picture and I got to hear the story. Why, how you managed to convince Inver house to let you put stained glass into a uh, Rick house. I don't know if they've realized yet. <laughs> Uh, that, that, that warehouse, uh, January 2010, we lost two warehouses through the weight of snow. That was an incredible winter that year. Uh, we had 2,480 casks maturing between the two warehouses. We lost 18 casks, so we're so lucky. Was, I don't know, it's somewhere about £100,000 worth of stock. Uh, the important thing, nobody's hurt. We, we can replace the buildings, replace the stock, can't replace people. 
Uh, the insurance company were an absolute delight to deal with, which may surprise you, but very, very good. So they settled very, very quickly. Um, we really didn't need the warehouse space at Knockdo. Uh, most of what we produce these days, apart from stock, we plan to use for single malt, we'll fill mature on site. Most of what we produce, we'll put in bulk tank or send it down the road, fill it into air day, mature it down there. So we reached an agreement with senior management. So we, we got to rebuild a warehouse. So I mean, you, you've seen the warehouse, you've been in the warehouse and you come down the road to the distillery, that warehouse looks like it's always been here. Uh, that warehouse is, is less than 10 years old. Uh, I don't know if you've got any pictures you can share from your trips. Uh, it's an absolutely beautiful building. Uh, stone built, traditional Dunnage warehouse. Uh, we're only going to go too high. There's there's no stowing machines. We still use skids and tables to stow the casks in there. And the, I, I suppose the stained glass windows are just a, a wee bit of a vanity project on my part. Well, it's beautiful. Uh, I loved it. I yeah, mean, that's uh, that was a classic move. I mean, it's just this. Uh, let me just show everybody else again uh, because this really is sort of like like a, a cathedral of whiskey almost in some ways, just because of the way it shows up. When you see the sun, and that's with the sunlight behind it. That's just a cropped photo because the sun was coming in on a partly cloudy day, typical Scottish weather. And I thought it was just because it's it represents the pagoda at Nakdu. And I thought it was brilliant. And uh, how did you find an artist to do it? And who did it? Let's give them credit for it if you remember who did it. Yeah, uh, it was Jennifer Jane Glass Creations. Uh, I can't remember the, the church, the big church in Aberdeen. It's got the Piper Alpha Memorial Tribute Window. And we saw that, we found out who made it. Uh, the artist came up and spent a day at the distillery and got a real feel for the place. And she came back with some, some concept drawings for us and they were absolutely stunning, but they, they were eye-wateringly expensive as well. So believe it or not, this is, this is the, the budget version, and I'm, I'm just so pleased with it. And as you say, when we get the sunlight coming through, somebody once told me church windows always look nicer from inside. I've never proved that theory for myself, but that window just comes alive when the, when the sun shines on it. Yeah. We've let the gable end of the stonework of, of that warehouse, so at nighttime, the, the light picks, all the, it picks out all the stonework, and it looks gorgeous. On the very rare occasion, I'm in a good mood. We can we can kill that big light, and we could put the back lights on for the stained glass windows. So it's just you know a little wee only, of whiskey and knock. <laughs> the only drawback is that I think that window faces to the west, so it only gets the evening sun uh, or the afternoon sun. No, you, you'll you'll pick it up from late morning. Yeah, okay. It, it depends on time of year as well how how high it is. Tell me about the relationship you have with the other distilleries within Inverhouse. Uh, let's just run through them real quickly. Uh, Pulteney, Bal Blair, Balmenic, which we hardly ever get to taste single malt from, Spayburn, and then Knock Dew. Yeah, so we're, we're all, I don't know, we're all of us are part of the same group, but we're, we're, we're also kind of semi-independent as well. And there's a, a nice bit of friendly rivalry between the five sites uh, when it comes to yield or, or volumes or energy numbers. Uh, Distillery manager, but I got all, everybody's really, really friendly with each other. Well, that, that's a, a common thing throughout the whole industry. Not, that's not unique to our five sites. Uh, and it, it's been a good, great to catch up on a weekly basis. If we found a, a better way to handle them all, or we're struggling them all, we, we can ask somebody else how they're getting on. So, I mean, and so the, the whole industry like that, is very, very good at sharing information or sharing spare parts or, or best practices or techniques or even sharing people if it comes to it. So when you guys start uh, going at each other, does Stuart have to play referee? No, uh, that would be my, my, my immediate boss, Derek Sinkler. Uh, he's... Diplomatically wrapped up into a six foot two barrel. Uh, really good guy to work for as well. Whiskey Jason says the Anak 2024, the Anak 24 was his single malt of the year in 2020. Tell us about that one. I never got to try this one. 
Uh, 24 replaced the 22-year-old. I, I think it should be available in somewhere about 20 states with you. It, it should be broadly available. A uh, 24-year-old has spent 20, 21 years maturing ex bourbon casks and then three to four years finishing or further maturing in first fill of Loroso casks. So you can the best of both worlds there. There's lots of vanilla notes, toffee from the bourbons, and you, you, you get the Christmas cake, uh, the dried fruit. So it's, it's a fantastic Saturday night whiskey. It's one of these whiskeys you want to... Take a dram down to the bottom of the garden, switch off the phone, leave me alone. This is my time world. And, and it's a whiskey to sniff and sip, sniff and sip. And it's one you don't want to rush. It's a whiskey that should come with its own do not disturb sign. Oh, most definitely. Yes. And Pete Head agrees with whiskey, J with whiskey Jason on that same here on the 24 year old. And as I pointed out, I've not gotten to taste that, but You've not had a big market in the U.S. for a knock. Hopefully that's going to change because I know that you switched importers about a year or so ago, right? That's right. We, we moved over to Hotling. Uh, they seem to be doing a really, really good job for us. So they represent all of our brands in the States. Uh, we've got the four single malt whiskies. Plus we've got Karoon and Gin in the portfolio as well. Um, a couple of rums. So there's, there's lots and lots of good things available. Uh, as I said, I think a knock is, is probably available in somewhere about 20 states. Uh, but Hotel Line, they've got a very good product finder on their website. So you can, it's www.hotelline www and go a product finder. Um, it's, it's a good way to use technology. You can, you, you can find bottles. It, it almost seems like technology has gotten us to the point where it's almost made it too easy in some ways because part of the, uh, the romance of whiskey before was uh, being able to go into a whiskey shop and find one of those dusty bottles that uh, you never actually thought you'd be able to find somewhere. I'm sure and these things still the happen. Nah, these, things, these things still happen, surely. Uh, I actually had a look at that product finder and I was pleasantly, sort of really surprised actually to see 22 year old Raskin and Cutter, that's two of her P variants with Cutter absolutely adored. They're still available in certain places with you guys. So once we get clear of this virus, I think I'll be booking me a plane ticket and come and buy some good whiskey. <laughs> Can't get those over here for loving their money. So. Let's talk about that because the last time you and I saw each other was in Cornwall about, uh, I think, a year and a half, two year, almost two years ago now at the oh, uh, Wonderful yeah. World of Whiskey show. It's been almost two years, and neither one of us has really been able to travel for the last year, and I'm going stir crazy. I don't know about you, but I, I'm, I am ready to get out and go see the world again. Yeah, it would be good. Uh I'm actually pretty happy. I'm pretty content in my own skin. Uh, I'm living in an absolutely beautiful part of the world. I get to run an absolutely beautiful distillery. I work with a fantastic bunch of guys. Uh, we've got four dogs at home just now as well. You can never have too many dogs. Uh, so life's pretty good. A wee break, a bit of sunshine would be nice now and again. Well, you live in Scotland. That's to be expected. I mean, you get that break of sunshine once or twice in the summertime, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was <laughs> a fantastic, fantastic whiskey festival, Cornwall, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And sad to say, it did not happen again this year. And since Ian Bentley, the guy who uh, put it all together for the Nav Center in Cornwall, has since left the Nav Center, I doubt we're going to be going back. I oh, that's hope that's not the case, baby. but. Uh, I would be very surprised. Uh, Tor Christensen in Norway says he can't wait to get back to Scotland. Although, Tor, you live in a pretty good part of the world, too, that I'd love to come visit one of these days. So uh, I wouldn't complain too much about not being able to get to Scotland yet, if I were you, Tor. Um, Gordon, where's the most unusual place that you found a bottle of whiskey that you made? Oh, jings. Uh, unusual. <laughs> Most out of the way place. Let's put it that way. Probably a whole one in our house. That would be the... 
Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, oh, oh God, I can't remember the name of the place now. We were in Menorca for a, a bit of summer sunshine a couple of years ago. Uh, wife, myself, out for a walk. I can't remember the name of the town. We popped in for a cup of coffee in the juice, little wee harbour side cafe. And the guy must have been a fan of whiskies. And lo and behold, there's a bottle of 12 year old Anok and this massive collection of whiskies that, that I'd had a hand in making. Um, you get a real buzz, a real kick anytime you see him. something you've had a hand in making, something you've helped to make anytime you see it on a shelf. And, and an even bigger buzz if you see somebody with a glass in hand and a smile on their face. That's one of, the, one of the great things about festivals and fairs and going out and, and meeting people. And our pal Whiskey Canuck in Quebec uh, was at that tasting in Cornwall, especially with all the, uh, the second one with all the cask samples, uh, someone um, smuggled in. It was amazing. Uh, I think the statute of limitations has expired on that. We can talk about that now. How did you uh, get all this, get samples in for that one? I had to pay a lot of money for that. Uh, I got charged a serious amount for excess baggage. Uh, that was Joanne McInnes' fault. Uh, if you're watching tonight, Joanne, hello, how are you? I uh, hope to catch up soon. Uh, it's Joanne that uh, arranged for me, me and my big box of samples to go across to Cornwall. Uh, Joanne must usually say, watches. I don't know if she's on tonight or not. but yeah. uh, I must say that the customs officials in Canada were very, very understanding. I was absolutely breaking it going through. And we just got a pat on the back. They found out where we were from, what we were there for. Pat on the back and just enjoy yourselves. You know? Great. After they got your credit card, right? No, no, that's, that's the thing. They didn't charge you? No, they're fantastic. Such nice people. And that was her experience. You must have known Joanne. She, she has friends at Canadian Customs. I'm told she's very close to them. <laughs> so... Are you at a knock for the rest of your career, or do you want to go someplace else? Do you have any desire to uh, to move around after 15, 16 years? No. I, I, you can never say never, Mark. Uh, knock is, is truly a neat place to work. I've never worked, worked with such a nice group of people in the world, ever. Uh, it's so rare these days you see people looking forward to coming to the work, enjoying what they do, and going home happy. And it doesn't matter. It could be the mankiest, dirtiest, filthiest job in the place, but the guys would just roll their sleeves up, get on and do it, do it with a smile. And that makes such a difference. And it, it's, it's not like a workplace. And it's always like a big toy box. You know, it's, it's, it's a great fun to play and think with things. And we, we love doing that. And we, we've got the freedom to do that here. Um, yeah, just I, the, the atmosphere, the environment is great. I don't have the photo of it handy to be able to show, but uh, one of your stills when it was repaired actually wound up having a Scottish saltire soldered into it. Is that still 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 <laughs> working? No, you know what was you're a, talking about, right? Yeah, it was a, a, a wee oversight. Uh, we we left a copper testing a wee bit too late, and uh, that was the the pot and the spirit still. Sorry, a little bit cramp here. The pot and the spirit still. Spirit still pots tend to wear out just above the fill level, and We've got lots and lots of copper above that and lots and lots of copper below that. You've got a, a thin bit that stretches around the whole circumference, maybe about 12 inches high. So we'd, we'd missed the window for that silent season. So we, we braced it up externally with solar. And as you say, it, it looked very patriotic for a while. It was like a row mm -hmm. of salt tires. So we changed that spirit still pot the following season. Spirit still pot should last about 15 years. So unfortunately, I'll have to replace that one again for another time. How much work do you go through um, tearing out old stuff and replacing it? Uh, give us an idea for those who aren't familiar with the silent season each summer of what you actually have to do to keep that distillery going year to year to year. Oh, silent season, we've got the, the, the statutory inspections. 
we, we need to, to strip the boiler, we'll, we'll completely remove everything, uh, you know, the insurance inspector, he'll actually crawl inside the, the water side of the boiler to check for corrosion. Every five years we need to get the, the, the wells ultrasonically tested just to ensure the integrity of the thing. And it's really the, the only chance, well, we run the distillery 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we'll run 47, 47 and a half weeks this year. So the silence season is so important. I mean, you, you have to get your repairs, your upgrades done in that three and a half, four week summer window. It really sets the tone for the rest of the year for the distillery. I mean, we've done the, the big ugly bits here. Uh, so it's, well, we've replaced the mash tun, uh, new head in the wash still a couple of years ago, new pot in the spirit still seven, eight years ago new boiler. So we've spent a reasonable sum of money in the place over the years. Uh, but we've got a, a crack and a very, very good yielding, very, very efficient weed distillery now. And the, the other thing we should really point out, uh, and you've been here, Mark, you, you know how the place works. These days, it's it's a very easy process to automate, controlled by SCADA systems, controlled by PLC. We don't have any of that here. The distillery is still completely manually operated. And we've got single manned operations with so one operator on shift at a time. So the guys have got a really, really busy shift. But it's a level of automation that we're comfortable with. Uh, biggest concern with automating everything we're, we're going to lose skills in a generation. I'm going to lose skills. So the guys still do everything by hand, traditional fashion. Yeah. And, and they enjoy doing it. How do you teach the next generation or can you teach the next generation how to do this manually so that uh, they don't have to rely on computers? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're really looking for attitude I mean, skills. We can teach uh, attitudes either there or it is not. Um, We've been pretty lucky with the, the, the guys that we've recruited over the years here. Um, and I said, it's just a case of having, having the right attitude. Just, just roll your sleeves up, get on with it. And be prepared to move a lot in your shift. Uh, be prepared to eat your lunch when you're walking. Uh, but hey, that's worth it. Do you find most of your people around the town of Knock or is it... Uh, trying to recruit people to come in from outside? Uh, just now, uh, we've got, well, it's only myself, actually lives in Knock, assistant manager lives two, two and a half miles up the road. Uh, we've got one in Huntley, two in Keith, and other one, I, he lives out in the countryside beside Keith. So we're all pretty, uh, within a 10 mile, nine mile, radius of the distillery. But is it hard to find good people in that general area or do you have to recruit them from outside? Yeah, well, we're actually in the throes of recruiting just now. Uh, so I think we're 300, 350 applicants for an operator's position. So if we can narrow that down to a short list, I don't know what we're doing to maybe 10, 12. So Hopefully, I don't know what format an interview is going to take this time around. Is it going to be Zoom or Teams or something like that? It's far better if we could do a face-to-face, -face if, if, if we can do that safely. Uh, applicants this time, uh, they, they really have come from far and wide. Uh, and not just the UK, we've had up, up overseas applicants as well. I'm not surprised because everybody... One of the common emails I get is, how do I get a job at a distillery? And it's, uh, I tell them, go to the website, but 350 applicants for a single position as an operator is actually a pretty good ratio. I would think uh, the odds are a little better. I've seen cases where they've had a couple of thousand applicants yeah. for the same job. I think this, the, the 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 advert was live on uh, I, don't, I don't know what website HR or HC is there these days was was live for a week and a half and they they pulled it and we got a, what they thought was a, a reasonable number of applicants. Chris Ratcliffe has a question: What happens to the old stills when you replace them? Are they more valuable as scrap copper? Or are people eager to buy them? How many times are they replaced and thickened or repaired and thickened in their lifetime? I know. Uh, 
Tobermory actually took one and cut it up and uh, enclosed pieces of it with one of its bottlings, one of its like 40 year old bottlings at one point a few years ago. But uh, what happens to those old stills when you get rid of them? Does uh, Forsyth go back and recycle them or what? It depends how the contract's written, Chris. You, you'll, you'll find quite often find these days that the, the scrap value of the metal is included in the price of the contract. So the, the, the scrap will become the, the coarseness property. We, we've still got a couple of bits here. We've got, we changed the light pipe on the wash still about a year and a half ago. So I kept that. I've still got the old head from the wash still. Um, we've got a shell and tube condenser, which we destroyed, which is still lying in the shed as well. So hopefully someday we get a visitor center VC of some sort. We can we can incorporate these in the display some way. That shed um, out back is amazing. There's all sorts of fun stuff out there, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, the, the shed... Uh, we put, uh, aesthetics are really important as well, Mark. Uh, well, not just for the warehouse. We needed a, a workshop, a tractor shed. So rather than just build a big steel box, which would be the cheapest and easiest way to do things, we, we put a little a bit of thought into this, the style and design. So we've we've incorporated, it's, it's actually Scottish larch. We've clad it with uh, nice, long, tall windows to add a bit of, a bit of light and it's just for the aesthetics of the place. Uh, the wee pump house next to it, uh, the, the pump house was a tribute to 1960s Scottish architecture, which was grey concrete block box. And you saw that as soon as you drove down the road. The distillery. So we've clad that in timber, put new doors, new windows on it, a new roof on it. And it's a, it's a very, very attractive wee building. And it's just a pump house and a paint store. But aesthetics are important. And we, we want the distillery to look at its best and look nice. I know... Uh when I was there both times, one time in June, one time in October, the flowers were out, the greenery was out. You guys had taken care of everything around the place. Uh, H.M. Hill has a good question. When you have to do that maintenance, if a washer spirit still needs to be replaced, how long does it take to order and receive the new still? Uh, in other words, how much lead time do you need to replace the still? Do you plan that silent season out a year or two in advance to keep up with the schedule at Forsyth's, right? Yeah, I mean, if it's for size, I'm doing the copper work. It depends how busy they are as well. I know a few years ago, you you had to plan your breakdowns two years in advance. Uh, and if, if they're really, really busy, if, I mean, it's not just Scotland they're making equipment for, and it's truly a global industry that for size supply equipment for these days. So if they're exceptionally busy, yeah, you're, you're potentially looking at a two-year lead time. So to try to overcome that, each year we'll do an ultrasonic thickness test on on the copper plant so we, we can gauge how the wear is going and hopefully predict where we're going to be in six months, 12 months, 18 months, two, two years' time. And you've got a subscriber to the podcast. Pete Head says, thanks to Willem for the podcast tip. Just subscribed. And uh, he was talking about the uh, Noctales podcast. Uh, which will be available wherever you get your podcast from, just like Whiskey Cast is. Uh, who else are you planning to have on the podcast? I know we have talked about doing something with it, uh, uh, with the folks who are working with you on it, but who else are you hoping to have on there? I don't know. As I said, it's not just going to be distillers or booze makers. I... I love seeing things done properly and done well and done with enthusiasm and pride. So if, if you can think of anybody that fits that category, and get, get in touch with our PR people. Uh, it could be a, a biscuit maker, a cheese maker, bicycle maker. Uh, as long as they enjoy what they do, put their heart and soul into it and, and produce a good product at the end of the day. And hopefully use traditional techniques, not these nasty modern computers and machines. So it's quite a broad range there. <laughs> so what motivates you at the start of the day? What gets you going and makes you excited to uh, get to the distillery and uh, start the day? The Besides the paycheck. <laughs> distillery, honestly, it's, it's, it's not, don't tell my boss, but it's not like work. Uh, as I said, everybody looks forward to coming to work at Knock Do. Uh, 
A distillery is more than the sum of the equipment and the buildings. Each distillery has its own ambience. I mean, you, you've been to lots and lots of distilleries. Uh, each distillery has a very, very unique feel. And I, I just love the feel of this place. Um, uh, Can you describe it for those who haven't been there? Ah, jings. Uh, it's a small, traditional, hands-on distillery where if, if you go around it, you can see and smell and touch everything. And the layout is so logical. You can follow the whole process from malt intake, grinding, mashing, fermentation, which are the best parts of the process, in my humble opinion. Uh, through the stills, we've, we've kept some of the old bits. We, we still use a lot of the old bits. Uh, filling store, getting the warehouse, and, and just the, the air, the smell, the ambience in the warehouse. Uh, it's just a combination of all these things. And if you can set that in the proper location, in a beautiful part of rural Aberdeenshire, um, it's, it's hard to beat, honestly. And I've got to have you tell me about that smell when you open the warehouse door for the first time in the morning after all that aroma has built up overnight or for a couple of days. What's it smell like when you open that door? Oh, it's just gorgeous, isn't it? Uh... I don't know. It's just just like smelling like a glass, isn't it? You know, uh, <clears throat> that beautiful evaporating alcohol smell combined with the, the earthiness, maybe a hint of dampness from the warehouse as well. Uh, that's just gorgeous. Chris Radcliffe has a good question. The tourism side of the business. Uh, back in the day, you never had visitors, did you? Other than occasional company guests and uh, people like me, things like that. You didn't have people just showing up for a tour, did you? Well, now and again we did. Uh, and because you pointed out we're difficult to find, well, we're not really that difficult to find, honest. Uh, we, we are a wee bit off the beaten track, I'll concede that. So we've found people come knocking on the door, looking for a visit, looking for a tour. They, they were genuine. Uh, when I worked in Poultney many years ago, that's before the visitor centre, you got a, a wet Tuesday afternoon in Wick. There's not an awful lot to do, or there wasn't an awful lot to do then. So people would come knocking the door looking for a tour just to kill a couple of hours. So you say, well, could you come back in an hour, come back in two hours? And if they came back, all good and well, you, you know there was maybe some kind of genuine interest there. But if you didn't see them again, you, you knew they found somebody else to bother. Um, but if people turn up in our, door, our doorstep here, we are a wee bit off the beaten track, so people do tend to be genuine. And we've got people that visit year on year on year, uh, which which is really, really pleasing. I love seeing that, so I think we probably must be doing something right. In fact, we had a whiskey festival tour a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a tour I was taking. I went 16 folk got off the minibus. Oh, shit. Oh, jinx. One or two of these faces look familiar. I'm absolutely terrible with names, and I find I'm getting pretty bad with faces these days as well. So, hello. Welcome to Not Do Distillery. Uh, put your hand up if you haven't been here before. Um, we got two hands out of the 16 going up. So, oh, wow. So, it, it's, it's fantastic to see people again and again and again. So, Kind of people, hopefully they're going to visit as customers and, and, and leave as friends. And we, we keep in touch with a lot of people that way. Graham Frazier uh, will not do be hosting events during the rescheduled Spirit of Speyside Festival in November. He'd very much like to visit. Um, I can guess that if you did anything, it wouldn't be part of the festival because Nakdu is not in Speyside. Yeah, but, well, they've, we've done bits and pieces with the festival for a few years now. Uh, we've got Ardmore, Glendronach, Glenglassa. I suppose they're a pretty similar situation to ourselves. So, yeah, it, it's, it's quite good to get involved with these things. You're just outside of the uh, official sort of space-side designation. Yeah, yeah, we're just, just in the borders. That's the, yeah. I know, uh, and you'll laugh when you hear this, I know... Bill Lumsden at Glen Morangy was suggesting a few years ago that, well, gee, we ought to really be part of Spirit of Space Side. I'm going, uh, no, you're all the way up on the other side of the uh, of the uh, of the lock and everything. No, you don't get to be part of Spirit of Space Side. But <laughs> well, why should geography get in the way of an opportunity? 
Absolutely not. <laughs> Graham Frazier wants to know, how much independence do you have from the head office? Um, I'm guessing when it comes to your production and the daily schedules and the daily grind and employee scheduling, uh, you're pretty much on your own, right? Yeah, as I say, we're about kind of three and a half hours from HQ. Um, I think as long as we don't don't break too don't break too many things, don't spend too much money, don't upset too many people. Yeah, I and mean, the, the distilleries are are pretty much left to take over on their on their own behalf. Um, we get very very regular contact with HQ or, or my boss, who's, who's based up in the north as well. Uh, but yeah, as long I, as you I, keep I, the uh, yields up, right? Yeah, yeah, we've just moved on to 2020 barley, which is fantastic. So it's it's processing yield and yield very, very well. It's good. How how closely do you have to watch the uh, the farm reports, for lack of a better term, to see how the uh, how barley prices are growing and how the barley crop is growing? Yeah, I mean it's, it's yeah. an essential part of our process. It's always our main raw material. Um, 2019 crop was okay. 2018 crop was was pretty poor, to be honest. Uh, we've noticed that a big, big difference in the quality. It's, it's a north-south divide in the quality of the 2020 crop barley. So the north, very, very good. Very low nitrogen levels. Uh, south, England, Shire, and just the, the weather, their growing season, harvest season, uh, it hasn't favoured them quite so well, the 2020 harvest. So I hope, I hope they keep the English barley for brewing this year. Um, the, Explain the, how nitrogen levels make a difference because we think of it as malted barley. You bring it in, you steep it, uh, you start it germinating, and it's uh, the germination process that starts creating the starches, but the nitrogen plays a big deal as well, right? Yeah, I mean, nitrogen is a protein which is non-fermentable. So the, the more nitrogen you have in barley, the less room you've got for fermentable to be starches, which are going to convert into fermentable sugars. We do need some nitrogen in the barley, obviously. It's a, it's a food stuff for our yeasts. So this year, I, I think the stuff we're taking in, the stuff, the, the malt we've taken in this year, the nitrogen is really low. It's good, it's good somewhere about 1.3%. Uh, last year, some of the stuff we see 1.6, 1.7%. So it, it doesn't sound a, a big, big difference, but yeah, that, that makes a big difference. The amount of fermentable extract you've got to play with from, from each, 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 each grain of barley. So nice low numbers, please. I know that here in the U.S., a lot of farmers will add nitrogen to their soil to, as fertilizer and to help improve the conditions of the soil. Are farmers in Scotland and in Europe that are doing barley, are they doing that as well? Yeah, same thing over this way, yeah. Uh, but very much that depends on weather conditions as well, uh, how, the, how the plants are going to uptake that nitrogen or is it going to get washed through. So the, the, the farmers need to play clever too with the, the weather forecasts and soil conditions before applying fertilizers. Oh, this is a good question from uh, Whiskey Canuck, uh, Sri Ram in uh, Quebec. How much would you like to put out some single cask bottlings or other unicorns you have in the warehouse? And if that is something you'd like to do, why <laughs> isn't it happening? Yeah, I'd love to. I, I absolutely adore single cask bottlings. Um, the casks are like people. They're, they're totally unique. No two casks are exactly the same. Um. We have started doing some single cast bottlings uh, from from not do, um, but they're, they're they're mainly casts that we've sold to customers and and bottled on their behalf. So I, I know there's two or three definitely been done for for Canadian market. Uh, there's been a couple in the UK, one in Switzerland, possibly two in Switzerland actually. So there there are nuggets there. There are these wood parcels available. Um, and that one in yeah. Australia you mentioned earlier that you've got yeah, in your last night. Yeah, that, that wasn't a single cast. That was a, a single oh. vintage. That was 2007 vintage. Yeah. And Chris Ratcliffe asks, if the whiskey fairy waved a wand, how would you change the distillery and what whiskeys would you love to do? I'm guessing you'd leave things alone. The distillery, yeah. I, I think we're, we're almost where we wanted to be now. Um, 
we spent a lot of time and effort over the last few years. So in, in, in NOC, we have 160 hours in each week. So we really want to make very, very best use of, of all of those hours. So we've broken the process down into bites of eight hours. So it takes eight hours from to do a mash. So you can do 20 eight hour mashing cycles in a week and still have eight hours for oh my gods and to play with. We run the wash still in the four hour cycle from charge to charge. Each charge is half of a wash back. So you can still a whole wash back in eight hours. You need two runs of low winds, one run of four shots and faints. That's the volume liquid four shots and faints you need for a charge this part of the cell which will run on the air cycle so the, the whole plant dovetails together so very very little i would change with the distillery uh, there was another part of that question that i've talked so long i've forgotten mark uh, um let's just what else would you what whiskeys would you like to make if you could uh i possibly just a, an age thing but i i absolutely adore bourbon mature whiskeys just now uh, maybe with the lighter days coming in as well, and daylight here to about six thirty, which is fantastic. Uh, winter's leaving us. We also do the the peated variants from here as well, which are fantastic. I, I think they're a, a beautiful, really good accompaniment to the, the, the non peated range. So we, we've we've probably got a, a bottle to suit every palate here just now, which which is pretty good. And the, the range has broadened over the years. You mentioned earlier that you had just completed uh, your peating distillery for the distillate for the year. Yep. How do you clean things out between the peated runs and the non-peated runs to make sure that none of it carries over? Aggressively, seriously aggressively. We'll lose probably a full day's production. Uh, we'll start the malt intake. We've, we've got three malt storage bins that are dedicated to peat. We'll never put plain malt in those bins again. I mean, the bins are contaminated beyond belief. The other side of that, we've got three un unpeated plain malt bins for production for most of the year. So when you get your last load of peated malt in, you follow that up with a, a load of plain malt and you'll, you'll flush three or four tons of plain malt, flush that through into a peaty bin, so that'll flush out your, your intake conveyor system. Uh, once you've finished your last PE grind, we'll do a plain grind and then we'll, we'll stop the process and we'll vacuum everything, the dust filters, the de-stoner, all the milling equipment, malt mill, it's all thoroughly vacuumed, we'll get rid of any hint of peatiness there. Uh, we'll pickle the mash tun in, in caustic soda, so we'll, we'll spray on very high temperature caustic soda, pressure wash it. Same thing with hot liquor tanks, uh, heat exchangers. Can't do an awful lot with the washbacks. They get a, a clean with high pressure boiling water, so that's okay. And the the same very very aggressive cleaning process in the stills. So I, I think we we can almost switch the phenols off, make the phenols go away in less than a week now, just by being this very very aggressive approach. Great question from Dave Kuhn. Besides the guys that you work with within Inverhouse, are there contemporaries in the distillery business that you reach out to for guidance? Uh, we all need friends and mentors in all walks of life, as Dave puts it. Do you have people whose knowledge you trust? And I'm going to vary this question a little bit. Who were your mentors growing up in the business as you got your start? Who taught you what you needed to know to make it work? Oh, jings. Uh, I mean, every day is a school day, honestly. You, you learn something new every day in the distillery. Uh, when I started in Pulteney in 1988, I was so lucky to work under John Black. Uh, I, I don't know if you've come across John. Uh, Willie McCallum was assistant manager, so or a brewer in those days. So was I talked with John when he was at Tullibardine before his passing. Yeah, uh, just... Such a nice guy to work for, uh, yeah. a real people person, and it, he'd been in the industry since he was 15 years old, and he knew the process like the back of his hand. So we were so lucky to work with these two guys initially. Uh, boss at Ball Blair, Derek Sinclair, uh, another great guy to work with. And that, as I say, that the, the industry as a whole, it's, if, if my boiler feed water pump blew up, I knew I could never cross the Glendronach and, and borrow their spare, and vice versa. If, if, I, if I could help them out, we would do it. And the industry through the SWA, the SWRI, the, the 
Malta Stores Association of Scotland were very, very good at sharing information, speak to each other regularly. Uh, so that it, it, it doesn't, until we get to sales and marketing, that the, the gloves come off and things get competitive. It's such a friendly industry to be involved with. It's, it's a very except for, uh, except for Bobby and Gordon and John at the other distilleries, they're a couple bunch of wankers, right? No, 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 no. Uh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Very few wankers in this industry. That's the... I know, I know. I, I will tell you, and... Uh, probably, I don't know if this is the highest compliment I can pay, but there is only one bottle of whiskey that I will not ever open. And it's uh, the Anak 12 that Peter Arkell did for me several years ago. Because it has our late sheepdog frizzle on the uh, label and the canister. It was it's part of that Anak moment promotion a few years ago. Yeah. I can always get another bottle of Anak 12, but I cannot replace this bottle. And we lost Frizz a few years ago, but as long as I've got this bottle, I've still got a little piece of her because uh, she's uh, featured on the canister. That's such a nice thing to have, Mark, isn't it? And so that is one that, uh, like I said, I can always get more in Oct 12. I can't replace that one. I hope and you're buying so a bottle of week. And, What? I hope you're buying at least a bottle a week. Oh, yeah, something like that. <laughs> And uh, Chris Tedzenko says, uh, hey there, Mark, from your friends down under. Chris, I hope you got to try that uh, Anak Australian exclusive. Uh, Tabitha, Spirit Bomb, that's really sweet. Uh, and uh, Spirit Bomb also says, I'm looking so forward to looking forward to visiting Scotland. Miss all my friends there. We can all say that. Amen to that, Tabitha. And thank you for sharing that. Gordon, I want to thank you for uh, spending the last hour with us uh, you have one of the most beautiful little distilleries in Scotland, and uh, I hope that more people get a chance to visit once we get through this pandemic. And uh, I know I'll be back, if only to check on that uh, that cask from uh, 2014 one of these days. Bring your checkbook. Yeah. No, th th thank you very much. much card. <laughs> thank you very much for having us on tonight. And, and also from the industry, thank you very much for the work you're doing promoting the industry in general. We, we, we really need folk like you on board and you're doing a great job. So it's fun. Thank you, Gordon. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you, my friend. And uh, I look forward to, uh, we've talked about uh, having me on your podcast and I can't wait to do it. Again, the podcast is Knocktails. You'll find it wherever you uh, get your podcasts. Uh, our pal Jared Hempstead from Balconis is the uh, first guest on that podcast series. So Gordon Bruce, thank you for joining us, and uh, we will uh, say goodbye to everybody here real quickly. Thanks again for watching, and uh, if you have comments, you can always uh, share them with us at uh, comments at whiskeycast.com. You can also uh, visit whiskeycast.com for all the latest news, my tasting notes, event updates, a lot more. And Laura Hemme of uh, Rowan Co. in Dublin will be my guest on this weekend's podcast. So until we meet again, I'm Mark Gillespie. Slanchava, take care of yourselves, wear your masks, be good to each other, and I'll see you soon. Good night, all. Slanchava.